Gabrielle Fisher, who will speak on opioid-dependent pregnant women. Gabrielle. Thank you very much, Mary Jean, for your introduction. Uh, we're going to be changing the topic and the language. First of all, I'm very grateful to the organizers, Jean-Pierre, Akais, and Mark, for re-inviting me to Biarritz. It's a wonderful symposium, a wonderful place, wonderful food, and great people. Thank you very much. Um, I will guide you the next 20 minutes on the topic of opioid dependence in pregnancy. First, I will start with more general remarks, and then I will be covering some studies depending on the time. Uh, it's depending how many. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the National Institute of Drug Abuse, the European Union, and Austrian funds to support the research I have been performing. In addition to all the colleagues who are involved in studying pregnant uh, women, which takes a long time, and many people being involved. But let me start. Uh, Nature, a year ago, had the topic putting gender on the agenda. Medicine, as it is currently applied to women, is less evidence-based than being applied to men. How to deal with the most fundamental sex difference? With pregnancy. Pregnant women get ill, and sick women get pregnant. Entering pregnant women in clinical trials is problematic for ethical reasons. The result is that physicians prescribe drugs whose effects during pregnancy are poorly known. I am a psychiatrist. I do suffer that we hardly have any, actually we have no evidence-based trials in psychopharmacological treatment, not in psychosis, and we treat psychotic patients, not in um, anxiety and mood disorders. One possible solution is systemic retrospective data collection from women who had no choice but to take an unproven drug while they were pregnant. This is an important aspect, but we do know that some limitations, or we have to put some women on risk and some fetuses until some um, uh, knowledge is gained retrospectively. Drug regulators should ensure that physicians and the public alike are aware of sex-based differences in drug reaction and dosages. Medical school accrediting bodies should impress the importance of training physicians in how disease symptoms and drug responses can differ by sex. More women into the senior ranks of science. The research community can take a number of steps to address these problems. Journal can insist that authors document the sex of animals in published papers. This is actually partly taken into account by the top journals. Funding agencies should demand that researchers justify sex inequities in grant proposals. This may be the first steps in the direction of truly personalized medicine. What, after all, is more personal than sex? And if we study pregnancy, we do need to take into account the wellness of the feeders and also the well-being of the mother. Very often, if we talk about drug dependence in pregnancy, I feel that partly the well-being of the mother-to-be is more neglected than the focus on the feeders. And I'm going to be show some, some key issue why it is very important to focus also, of course, on the well-being of the mother. Women who give birth annually, about 4 million women in the U.S., 131 million worldwide. 64% in the U.S. are given prescription for medication for chronic medical or acute problems during pregnancies. The problem is, if pregnant women are excluded, we do not know not only the safety and the efficacy of the medication, but there are problems in incorrect dosing, in ineffective subtherapeutic treatment, and probably drug resistance. In our target group, we not only focus 
the influence of the medication. We do know that there are many other influences. There are many other substances. And we do know that about 95% of our patients who are opioid dependent are severely nicotine dependent. And unfortunately, it used to be a very wrong conclusion in former times where nicotine was not focused so much on the, on the outcome, that it was stated methadone relates to babies of being small of gestational age. Now we do know it's much more nicotine related in all of the studies. Uh, alcohol. We actually should also watch the alcohol consumption in our opioid pregnant um, patients. And of course, continuous drug abuse is increasing the risk of the unborn child to continued violence, malnutrition, and other difficult aspects. And what's very important, and we are in the field who are working out with these patients, we do know that they have quite some assortative mating. About 50% is also having a codependent partner. And if you're not enrolling the partner into treatment, we will not be successful in treating the woman. One of the key aspects, what I was pointing out already, we should not neglect, and what's very important, to look into the comorbidity of uh, other psychiatric disorders. These are data in the general population. They Pink columns refer to females, the, the blue to males. About double as many women suffer on mood disorders compared to males. If we look into the comorbidity in drug dependence, around 53% of the individuals show psychiatric comorbidity. Even still more than tw about 20% in the longitudinal after treatment approach. Mood and anxiety disorders in opioid-dependent pregnant people showed a negative effect on treatment outcomes. Depressed women were more likely tested positive for additional drug consumption during pregnancy. In babies born to women with mood disorders stayed longer in neonatal intensive care unit, mostly related to uh, psychopharmacal medication and unfortunately most related to benzodiazepine medication. And in general, the prevalence of psychiatric disorders in pregnancy is ranges between 7 and 16 percent. And that's one issue. We do not have evidence-based control trials in any antidepressant medication. I give you an overview on the comorbidity on uh, women. We were investigating in our mother trial. It's an, the evidence-based double-blind dynamic double control trial between buprenorphine and methadone in pregnancy. At the enrollment, just to give, an, to give you a clue how high the comorbidity of this group of patients is. Also, we had a very selected group of patients. Our patient needed to have only the diagnosis of opioid dependence and nicotine and cannabis abuse and consumption was permitted. Uh, and no major psychiatric disorder at the time of enrollment. We look at about um, uh, 174 opioid-dependent patients, and they were recruited from two, four, six, seven sites. And uh, the mean age is about 27 years old. The majority are Caucasian. The majority is not married. Only a minority is employed. We had a very low, actually this is kind of a positive selected group because very low pending legal issues as this was an um, exclusion criteria. And if you look at the comorbidity, about 65% had in their past a psychiatric uh, major um, uh, disorder, uh, mostly depressive disorders and anxiety disorders. And even 30 days prior to the inclusion of the study, um, about 50% showed anxiety symptoms and depressive symptoms. So that we do not treat the, in quote, healthy opioid dependent pregnant woman. We have a comorbid population we need to consider. And this is actually referring that the, uh, the higher the, the, uh, the psychiatric comorbidity, the more significant medical, social, psychological and drug-related problem uh, are in this group of patients. 
The finding highlights the importance of evaluating and treating co-occurring psychiatric illnesses in opioid-dependent women during pregnancy, and the unawareness of the psychiatric comorbidity. And this actually is very often, we have the discussion, like in my small European country, how well are the patients taken care of in GP's offices. And we had this discussion yesterday here. I think one third is perfectly fine in GP offices, but I'm very much convinced that pregnant addicts need to go to special clinics, not only have, uh, also having the, the proper diagnosis to be able to treat them on a proper basis. Because very often the use of benzodiazepines uh, happens, however, we do know there is no indication for benzodiazepine prescription in any um, uh, uh, affective disorder, long-term prescription in pregnancy. And we have to bear in mind, benzodiazepines are referring to category D drugs, which states there is a positive evidence of human fetal risk, but the benefits from use in pregnant women may be acceptable despite the risk. Like if the drug is needed in a life-threatening situation, or for a serious disease for which safer drugs cannot be used or are ineffective. So I really, what I have been learning over all the years, be very careful in uh, administering uh, benzodiazepines. Um, well, SSRIs, we face this very often, stated mood disorders, how to treat the mood disorders. We have been learning from retrospective data collection, what was focused, uh, um, in, in the Nature Journal, uh, that unfortunately paroxidine is yielding to uh, um, persistent pulmonary hypertension in the newborns. So we are not supposed uh, to use this medication. Well, it's a dilemma. I think the proper diagnostic uh, tools are very important to, to reduce the risk of, um, uh, in, in, in feeders and mothers, but we need to treat them. And I'm very much uh, asking for controlled trials in antidepressant disorder. But coming to some data now in the opioid-dependent pregnant women, we do know there's an increasing amount, also because we have an increasing amount of opioid-maintained women. Uh, and we do know Detoxification would be ideal, but it's very difficult and very hard to, uh, to uh, remain uh, drug-free. We have the most experience with methadone, and we have increasing experience with buprenorphine, mostly actually over the last decades from naturalistic studies coming out of France, where buprenorphine has been uh, registered for a very long time. We know that both medication keeps women in medical treatment, it's increasing the retention, and it's reducing illicit drug consumption. Uh, no registration studies are available for neither of the substances, and I would very much be happy looking after the data, and the data over all the years, also from controlled trials, to have both medication registered for pregnancies. Many wrong conclusions are drawn, like I have been pointing out to nicotine, and what we have to bear in mind that there is still a heterogeneous approach on the treatment of neonatal abstinence syndrome, whereas there seems to be a consensus that morphine is the standard of care and choice. Um, still, some countries are using phenobarbiturates, and some are even, unfortunately, using neuroleptics. Uh, the neonatal abstinence syndrome, I think, is pretty familiar to the um, audience here. It's a necessity, it's a requirement to treat, but it's not only after opioid exposure, it's also, uh, it, um, we see a neonatal abstinence syndrome after intrauterine SSRI or antipsychotic or antipsychopharmacological medication, and actually the longest neonatal abstinence syndrome is related to benzodiazepine consumption during pregnancy. And I wanna, uh, use uh, this picture of Loretta Finnegan of thanking her for being a pioneer in this field, always uh, being a pediatrician, looking into the standard of care uh, for, um, for these women and being an advocate of opioid maintenance uh, during this um, uh, period. Well, these are two substances who have been investigated in an evidence-based control trial. We do know, uh, and uh, 
both a very valuable medication in the field, and we have to take this serious. And unfortunately, occasionally it's not very rational um, discussed, as it seems to be partly polarizing either or the substance. I think both medication are very important to be available in the field. And I'm coming from Austria, and we have some colleagues from Switzerland. We do also have an option. We have oral slow-release morphine as maintenance agent available. I've been doing some studies more than 10 years ago. So uh, it's an important um, uh, medication. If you look at the QD data just shown, it's uh, very interesting to see this. And I do know that there are some medications under um, investigation to add naloxone to uh, avoid uh, diversification on the market. This is just very briefly to mention that we have to be aware that uh, in the Cochrane reviews and in a study we have been publishing four years ago, that there is no positive correlation between the mean dosing of the opioid at delivery and the intensity uh, of the neonatal abstinence syndrome. It's unfortunately, very often out in the field, uh, physicians tend to reduce the opioid, and then it becomes the benzodiazepine, which is actually the opposite of what we wanting for this uh, population. And I want to refer to this aspect. If you look, when is the mean onset of the neonatal abstinence syndrome? And I'm pointing this out because we all, as I'm in a huge hospital, I get the cost economists, you know, on my back and say, Oh, they, 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 because we want them to be in the hospital, roaming in with the mothers. They, it's, it's, we, we should discharge them two days afterwards. I'm very much against this because about 72 hours after the last medication is the onset of a neonatal abstinence syndrome after buprenorphine. So we would miss this if we do have an early discharge. I do know that in the United States, it's not such a privileged situation as we still have in Europe. But I think it's putting the women under a lot of stress if you are not considering that the onset might be later. A last aspect before I just show you the data. Uh, of course, it's neither methadone alone or buprenorphine alone. It's the combination of a comprehensive care model. And uh, there is one very nice paper by Marta Velez stating the importance of non-pharmacological assistance in the treatment of mothers and neonates. Um, that's my hospital in Vienna, where I do have the privilege of uh, having everything in one compound. And um, our treatment center, we are, doing, we are running all the uh, research studies, has a multi-professional staff and a high interdisciplinarity uh, with all the disciplines um, in uh, the university clinic. And we started 1998 looking into the first open level pregnancies uh, on buprenorphine and reporting very carefully the outcome. I do remember I had discussions with Mary Jean Greek about the ethics and the approval. So uh, it was a very careful, long approach looking into a very careful selected group of patients Finally, that we started to doing the double-blind, double-dummy comparison studies together with Ed Johnson, who um, designed the protocol at Johns Hopkins at this time, and uh, not neglecting all our French colleagues like Laurent Gorrieri, who is sitting here, Marc Auriacombe, and many uh, French um, scientists out in the field who provided the first contribution on buprenorphine. And at the end of my talk, uh, I will present you uh, probably the best trial we have in the whole medical field, the double-blind, double-dummy trial on comparing buprenorphine and methadone. There are other trials. One is in malaria. One is in HIV medication in pregnancy. But in the field out there, we have a much higher prevalence. We really like this uh, investigation. This study was published um, about a year ago in the New England Journal of Medicine. And this was the really complicated uh, design. Um, the consent, the screening, where I was showing you first the 175 women with the comorbidity being enrolled in the trial, getting medical clearance, stratifying for cocaine uh, consumption, and blindly randomized to either buprenorphine and methadone until four weeks after delivery, and then they had the choice of what kind of medication. We had a flexible medication design, 
and we had contingency management. Not that sophisticated as Sylvie was presenting us yesterday after Petri's model, but we had an escalating voucher system for drug-free uh, urines. Just to, the induction was done out of safety reason on an inpatient basis, and we used three days prior to the induction rapid release morphine. So all the women were uh, maintained were for three days on rapid uh, release morphine, and then inducted to either buprenorphine and uh, methadone. Primary outcome measures, as was defined when we started the trial, treat. Uh, Treated for NIS, NIS speaks for a total amount of morphine for the NIS, days of infant hospitalization, head circumference. I would now choose other primary outcome measures because uh, the length of hospital stay is not really too relevant. I rather would go for the days of treatment. Uh, and we had clear defined, and it's uh, for you, it's um, readable in the, in the New England Journal, uh, structured secondary neonatal and maternal outcome measures. And we also took in our calculations uh, into account the concomitant variables in the analysis, setting the alpha to 0.1 and, of course, with all the Bonferroni uh, corrections in the multiple uh, analysis. So we screened more than 1,000 patients at all sites. Um, we could randomize 16% of the population. Some people were very critical and say, listen, this is not representative for the, for the whole population if you only randomize 16% of the population. But how to meet the criteria of evidence-based research if you're not having a clear, stratified design? Um, we had 131 completers, 12% of the screen population are finished um, the study trial, uh, which means four weeks after delivery. And just to cut it very shortly, there were no relevant differences on the demographics between the medication groups. How look at the NAS? This is a curve. Uh, the, uh, this, uh, the, the blue and the pink shows you uh, the NAS scores, and the green curve shows you the curve of the buprenorphine uh, exposed uh, neonates and the treatment, the treatment of morphine drops and the uh, red curve shows you the methadone uh, exposed um, neonates in their curve of morphine uh, treatment. So you see quite a, quite a significant difference uh, between the course of the curves and I need to um, mention that we did not have any significant difference between the concomitant consumption between the two groups. To it's make it very clear, the medicated uh, days of NIS is about four days uh, for buprenorphine and an, um, a mean of about 10 days for methadone-exposed neonates. So this is a, another figure what shows impressively the differences between the numbers of days and the morphine dose applied and here, just for your information, the days of hospital stay, which is very often much more social reason related than it's medically related. If we do the calculations without or with all the concomitant variables, there's no differences, uh, major differences in significance between uh, morphine um, applied for NAS and days of uh, um, medication. What about the dropouts? We do have quite a difference in the dropout rates. We have uh, quite more uh, dropouts on the buprenorphine group when compared uh, to the methadone group, and the buprenorphine maintained patients dropped out uh, much earlier than the methadone maintained patients. And there was a significant, we had the rating about the being satisfied with the medication and buprenorphine dropouts were, to a high extent, unsatisfied with the medication. So what can be the interpretation? Bupen induction, buprenorphine induction could be too slow, could have been too slow. Maximum buprenorphine dose could have been too slow. Individual variation in absorption of sublingual uh, tablets or also, and I cannot go into detail into this, that there might also have been some side influences of how to induct this. 
or it might also be some pharmacogenomic differences, how women are responding. Um, this, I think, it's, it's, it's required to go into much more details in further um, investigation. So my conclusion is we do need both medications, as both medications are safe and efficacious. But out of this trial, out of this evidence-based trial, we had 16% randomized, 12% completed, more dropouts on buprenorphine. In the 131 investigated group, there was no significant difference between the occurrence of a neonatal abstinence syndrome. This is pretty much in consensus to all the literature we have been reviewing over the last years. Um, no significant difference between uh, the buprenorphine and methadone group in regard to NIS to treat. However, a significant shorter uh, duration of treatment for the buprenorphine group and significant less morphine administered for that. Now the contingency management. I did not show this slide. We had a very slow concomitant consumption in this group um, of patients. I think it's very important to to provide these assets during the course of pregnancy because it's a very effective tool to reduce concomitant consumption to really relate to the differences of medication. This is just the, the Vienna side. Our women got on average 1,700 euros, which is a lot for them and which not, has, has not been that as established as in the United States. I need to say that in our side, we only had 10% of dropouts which is remarkably well if you consider that patients have to come every day for an average of 22 weeks, which is unbelievable if somebody tells us our patients are not compliant. I hardly know any other uh, population being that compliant. But what I want to refer at the end is that uh, we had a 15% premature delivery rate. And if you consider, and this is just emphasizing what kind of a target risk population we are treating here. You cannot provide any better treatment than daily visits. And still, we have about double the uh, normal uh, preterm delivery rate, which is in the general population, seven days. And what, oh, this actually uh, pumped up. What, what I have been, what I'm told by my hospital constantly, that uh, increasing costs, I'm in favor of, of supporting uh, personal costs during the course of delivery and also uh, um, multi-professional care afterwards, like grooming in. You see that the average cost for preterm delivery is 90,000 prior to 37th week for the lifetime span until getting 18, and these are the costs. So I think we have to advocate the health system to justify to invest money in treatment during, deliver, during pregnancy and afterwards. Thank you very much.